If you're looking for success in the vacation rental industry, Heather Bayer and the team at CottageBlogger.com are here to show you that it's entirely within reach. Welcome to Vacation Rental Success, the show that features interviews with industry experts, successful vacation rental owners, and more, all geared toward helping you make it happen. Here's your host, Heather Bayer. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. This is your host, Heather Bayer. And as ever, I am completely delighted to be back with you once again. Uh, If you're listening to this on publication date... It is just today before we head off to the uh, to San Antonio for the Vacation Rental Success Summit. So you're probably going to be very happy to not hear me talking about it anymore for a little while. And uh, and certainly you know in the, in the next week or so I'm going to be bringing you a lot of what I learnt from the summit and some of the nuggets that I collected and talking about some of the really great people I met there. After that, we'll be going on into full force on the vacation rental formula, which for those of you who are members of VRF know it's a collection of educational resources, of tutorials, and it's been a little bit in abeyance for the past year or so, mainly because we've been so concentrating on making VRSS so so excellent. And that does take a lot of time and effort. But uh, once VRSS is over and done with, then Mike, myself and Jason are going to be spending much more time in really making VRF something that, uh, that we can be proud of and that will take all our members forward in an educated way. Uh, The other thing that I'm going to be spending a lot more time on too is AVROA, the Association Vacation Rental Operators and Affiliates. As chair of the Education Committee, I'm responsible really for bringing all the resources and educational materials that we find out there in the big wide world and we bring them to our AVROA members. And what we've been doing uh, recently is we started out with uh, a series of webinars and these are going to be coming monthly. So I'll put a link on uh, on the show notes to the Avroa webinars so you can go there and take a look and see what's upcoming. And the great thing about these webinars is that we are inviting people who really know what they're talking about in this industry to come along and do an hour of education and there will be no selling. So... While we know that we often listen to webinars that give us some some really great information, and we know that we at VRF do these types of webinars, you know, we're we're looking for new members for VRF. So we'll do a webinar. And at the end, we do invite attendees to come and join us at the Vacation Rental Formula. But with the Avroa webinars, these are slightly different. There will be no Um, sales pitch whatsoever. So it's going to be an hour of pure education. Recently, we had uh, Joe Godar talking about the Vacation Rental 101, the real basics that anybody might want to know if they're starting in the business. And the next webinar upcoming in the next couple of weeks is all about tax. So we have found a great CPA who understands the vacation rental business. A lot of her clients are vacation rental owners. So I know that there's plenty of people out there who would love to know a little bit more about deductions and claims and allowances or whatever you call it to do with your uh, vacation rental tax. So you can tune into that if you're, um, if you are an Avro member, it's free. Uh, If, if not, uh, there's just a small charge to take part and to listen to that, but really educational. And then upcoming, we've got, uh, we've got one with Tyan Marsink, who's going to be talking about vacation rental photography. And if you've ever seen any of Tyan's photographs, then you'll know that you can, we can all learn a huge amount from her. So back to today and today's episode. In line with my current interest in Airbnb, because our new house building is coming along apace and we're going to have an apartment at uh, the lower part of the house that I am going to rent out on Airbnb. So I'm in mega learning mode, learning a lot about the business as, as it runs on Airbnb because I, I don't actually know a huge amount about it. 
But in that vein, I have been interviewing a number of people recently who know a lot about Airbnb because they have been in it for a number of years and some of them are making a full-time living out of their Airbnb business. And today's guest, Anna Rawlins, is one of those. She has published a book called Airbnb Investor Style, a wildly profitable business in the sharing economy. So I'm going to be talking to her about her experience, how she got into the Airbnb world, what she's doing now, and how she's bringing her entrepreneurial style to the vacation rental, short-term rental business. So without further ado, let's move on over to my interview with Anna Rawlins. So I'm delighted to have with me today Anna Rawlings from Airbnb Investor Style, which is in fact the title of her book. Really delighted to have you with me today, Anna. And you are calling in from Colorado, right? I am. Thanks so much for having me here today. Oh, it's a pleasure. A real pleasure. What's your weather like? I have a, I have a thing here about, uh, about the weather. I think it's because li- you know, living in Ontario, we have some... <laughs> some weird and wonderful weather and we've actually got a heat wave now which is better than the snow we had two weeks ago so what about you yeah it's it's sunny right now but colorado is um it can change dramatically very quickly so we will see what it is this afternoon (laughs) and tomorrow it could be snowing i mean it's it's real that it can go from 70 to 80 all the way down to 40 50 in the same hour it's, it sounds like you have some, you know, you, you've got weird weather like we do. Um, I'm so pleased you've, um, you, you, you're joining me. I, I've been explaining to my listeners over the past couple of weeks that I'm really getting into Airbnb mode because I've been in the vacation rental business for over 25 years, but I mean vacation rentals. So, I, yeah, I remember interviewing Jasper Ribbers, um, who published Get Paid for Your Pad, and Jasper's been on the on the podcast a couple of times and I interviewed him quite a few years ago when I started the podcast and I was an Airbnb to me was something completely alien and I think I think I I sort of talked to him as if he had this weird and wonderful thing he was doing and it wasn't going to last five minutes but I gave him the airtime anyway (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and now look what's happened. Yeah, I, I interviewed him again recently and I said, I'm so sorry. I said, I, I, must, have, I must have come across as really weird on that, on, that, on that episode. But yes, I am now because I'm, I'm building my own home at the moment and I'm creating a complete apartment in the lower level where, that I'm going to rent out on Airbnb. And it'll be the first time that I've done this. So I'm in real learning mode. I mean, I've had, a, I've had six or seven properties that I've rented the homes that I've rented in, in the vacation rental market. But uh, I am, as I say, I'm in learning mode and I know I can learn from you. So because you've been doing this for some time, you've made a business of it. And I'd love to hear how you started out with that and um, how you got to where you are now. Well, yeah. So how I got into all this. So three years ago, I quit my job um, without a plan, honestly. Um, I don't advise that to anyone. <laughs> but what it did was it put a bit of fire underneath me to really have to figure out something. I was committed to starting my own business, but truly I I didn't know what type of business, I didn't know what industry. And I was really just, you know, sick of, I, I had been the um, operator of startups for years and and always, you know, brought significant financial growth to the startups, but I was still an employee. And so I was still really only getting paid for the work I was doing, not the, you know, I could sign mm-hmm. an $80,000 contract and still only make $2,500 a month. I just got frustrated with that. I was like, if I make success, I want to feel it as an owner. And if I fail, I want to feel that as an owner. And so I was committed to starting my own business. Someone told me about Airbnb and I tried it on a condo that I owned at the the time. I actually moved myself out of it into my best friend's basement and started Airbnb-ing it. And it was just a simple little college-like condo um, with very simple furniture. But within a month, I replaced my 
job income that I had had previously, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> if I can do this with a simple little college space, you know, mm-hmm. what could I do if I had um, more property? And at the time, you know, I had quit my job and racked up a bunch of credit card debt, so I was not really in a position to go out and buy more properties, but I was committed to growing the business, so I started working with property owners. Um, and creating win-win arrangements with them to actually, in different models, run Airbnb in their properties. That was kind of the birth of the business, and since then have grown it. I now have 31 listings, and I only own one of them. Um, and so, the, the, I mean, that is the mm-hmm. kind of core of my business model is running Airbnbs and properties that I don't even have to own um, and teaching other people how to do that. So, yeah. Okay, so so what you're talking about is co-hosting with with well, Airbnb. That is one of the models. Um, and Airbnb, you know, launched the ability to do that formally um, within the last year, which is great. I was doing it before it was a thing. Um, and having to do all the financial management and shit profit share manually, and now Airbnb allows you to do that. But there's also another model that I employ, which people now are talking about it in terms of the phrase master lease, or I've heard people say Airbnb arbitrage. Um, and basically, um, it's creating a little bit, it's a little bit different than co hosting because it's putting me more in the position of a tenant financially and so I'm paying the bills on the property um, but I only do that on, on um, properties that are going to make such a significant amount um, per month that it actually pays the bill for the homeowners and then makes me profit as well. Okay, can we can we just explore that a little more um, about the, the difference between co-hosting, master lease and arbitrage? I'm assuming that, that master leasing is, you know, is, that, is that where you take on the leases of other uh, other properties, and oh, I'll tell you what, I'll let you explain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so co-hosting, you know, a lot of people are familiar with now because it, it is actually a, a platform-supported way of running Airbnbs and properties you do not own. Um, so it's it's really just a profit share. So you mm-hmm. come up with a percentage that you would like um, as the manager of the Airbnb, um, and then the homeowner gets to supply the, the property. Um, and, and all of that money transfer happens. So let's say I usually do 75, 25%. The homeowner keeps 75%. I keep 25%. And all of that money transfer happens per reservation um, on Airbnb itself. And it's super simple now that Airbnb supports that as a model to run Airbnbs. And that's co-hosting. The master lease is... I will sign a lease um, with a property owner with the understanding that my intention is to Airbnb the property. Um, And sometimes I'll put a profit share in there for them too. But the idea is that they're getting their rental payment every month and perhaps a bit more. Um, And then I'm making all the Airbnb profit off of it. And so that is, you know, a, a model that I will obviously only engage in if it's a going to be a profitable property. And so part of what I teach people to do is how to find properties that are going to be profitable because it is a bit more risky of a model, but when you find a great property, it is lucrative. So. And I suppose for the owner that there are a number of benefits because the, the, the property is being professionally managed. I mean, maybe I'm a little biased because I've been in this industry for so long, but I think the risk has to be less than the risk of not knowing who's going to come into your property in a residential rental and rent rent it for tar- for, for a certain amount, a, a much lengthier time. And then, of course, getting into Landlord Tenant Act issues. That when you, you're explaining that, I'm thinking, hmm, if I was, if I was a, an owner of a property and I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to get my rental and feeling much more confident that it's being managed professionally, even when there's different people going in there at a much you know, shorter intervals. So a lot of the reasons that homeowners will end up liking the arrangement of a master lease is some of the things you talked about. But in addition, 
these properties get cleaned Mm -hmm. sometimes like up to five times a week yes and a you know with the constant flip overs and in a normal tenant situation i mean if you've got a tenant that isn't a particularly clean person you can have build up of mess for months and months and months and months and um i've run a cleaning company and part of running airbnb is running (laughs) a cleaning company and so the cleaning involved in airbnb management on a property is going to guarantee that your place is staying much more Mm -hmm. clean than with a regular tenant and so homeowners tend to really like knowing that and and also getting on airbnb itself and being able to see the pictures and see the reviews and see how many guests have commented on how clean the place is staying and so that ends up being a value that they don't always know they're going to get until they've felt it seen it um experienced it this is great because i i just sort of heard of this more in terms of, of regulations, because we, you know, we've, we've been hitting regulatory issues um, in Toronto. So I, I'd, I'd heard about this type of, of, of rental and management. Um, but thank you for giving me such you know, a really clear explanation of what it is. It is so much clearer in my head now. So, so let, let me ask you another question. When you're co-hosting, are the, are the owners doing their own listings? Do they put up their own listings and then you just have management of those listings? Or, or do you have, um, ha- have some input into the listings themselves? Yeah, so the way I do it is I generally am attracting clients that are just starting off with Airbnb. Um, and so it is a full comprehensive package, if you will, that includes getting it listed, getting the pictures taken, getting it staged sometimes, um, depending on the needs, um, and really just and getting all the regulatory issues for that particular area figured out, and getting them started. Um, so for me, it is me setting up the listing and then adding them on um, mm-hmm. so that they get paid. But like you know, you can do it either way. Okay, so so within the Airbnb structure, when the rental comes in, rental money comes in from the guest, then it sits an Airbnb process that splits out your twenty five percent and the owner's seventy five percent. Exactly. Okay. Well, let, let me just look at this. I, I'm a property manager, so I manage. My, my company manages just under 200 properties. We advertise on HomeAway and VRBO and Canada Stays and numerous other channels. Do you feel that, that doing this this way is, um, is confining you in any way? Because you're, you're just on the one platform. Do you have the, the, the ability to market out to other channels or do you not think that's necessary? Uh, that's a wonderful question. I was actually talking to my business part, partner in this morning. Uh, so I actually have used HomeAway um, on a couple of my properties for the first time this year. Um, and honestly, I very much like Airbnb for a lot of reasons that have a lot more to do just with like my own value system and why I love doing this in the first place. And Airbnb really has a lot in their business model around making it an experience for people. I mean, their mission statement is a world where everyone feels like they belong. So there's some of the values behind Airbnb that I just am so in line with that I love using them as a platform. And this year in particular, I I have noticed that there's been a shift in saturation Mm -hmm. um, in markets using Airbnb, but also the regulatory stuff that you mentioned has affected frankly, what you're able to charge property to property as, a, as opposed to what it looked like three years ago. And so this year I did start experimenting with posting some of my listings on HomeAway as well. And um, there's, I think, more and more a reason to kind of branch off onto other channels. And, and that's definitely something I'm looking to do this year. So. I'd, I'd love to hear what, from your perspective, what are the you know, the, the major differences between doing this this co-host model and a more of more of a conventional property management model when you're out there with um, with the other OTAs. Well, co- co-hosting on Airbnb is is very simple in terms of the financial management piece of it because the system itself like you said, does split the 75-25 per reservation for you. 
There's no waiting for payouts. There's no sending invoices, um, you know, to the homeowner or to the guest. I mean, it is all automatically done. And Airbnb supports co-hosting, supports doing this type of, you know, arrangement with homeowners uh, running Airbnbs and homes that you do not own. My experience with HomeAway, which is fairly limited still, but is that it's not that they don't support it as a model, um, but it is it is a little bit more red um, red taped, if you will. <laughs> uh, you know, I have to get a letter from the homeowner saying that I'm allowed to be running, um, you know, an Airbnb in the home before the and it it is, has taken. Uh, a, a month or more for that to be processed in order for them to allow me to receive money on a home that I'm running on home away in this way. Uh, the payouts are not direct. So there is more of financial management for me. That all being said, although, you know, kind of logistically it's, it's a bit more work for me. Um, home away in general, I have noticed, uh, does attract a more, um, long like planner type um than airbnb airbnb you know startup story is is the founder put some blow up mattresses in his living room and started charging his friends to stay uh um in his living room um and, and that was truly the birth of airbnb and so with that kind of grassroots you know simple startup story they've really carried that through um and just in terms of the type of guests that airbnb attracts uh they tend to be more fly by the seat of your pants book at the last minute you know maybe looking for a lower price point and i've noticed that home away is a little bit more of a we want to plan our our trip uh type of of traveler you know we'll plan out months in advance we're willing to pay more maybe a little bit more sophisticated of a traveler Despite the kind of differences in the money management, you certainly can get um, some great guests and booking further in advance and paying more um, on home away. And so that is why I started using both um, and plan to continue to do so. So, so how, how do you acquire your owners? It's always been an interesting, uh, interesting topic for me, uh, you know, as, as with any other property manager, um, particularly well, you know, when you mentioned that word saturation. Areas are, are becoming saturated not only with, with properties, but saturated with people who want to manage them as well. What's your unique selling point? What gets your clients coming to you rather than others? Well, I would say that just employing the master lease option for homeowners in general is is fairly attractive for folks that are actually looking for regular renters. Um, and that is a place that I start quite frequently is just going on common sites where you might find someone posting a rental, you know, where they're looking for new tenants. Um, and, I, and I start a conversation with them and I say, hey, you know, what if I were to sign your lease for the amount that you are asking for um, as a tenant? And um, and I have a special uh, way that I'd like to do it. And that just opens the conversation. Um, and, you know, of course, I have contracts and templates and things that I use to engage in that conversation further. And that's what I teach people to do. But um, it really starts with finding people that, were, that you know, are already doing um, – usually more long-term rentals and then introducing them to this new, this new idea and way of doing things. What, what do you find is the, is, is the common response when you make that first approach? Uh, there's always a lot of questions. <laughs> so lots of times people are very intrigued at the idea at all, right? Because it generally is something they haven't even thought about or no one's presented to them before. But there's a lot of questions. There's questions about the wear and tear on the home. What are, you know, insurance protections? What is the arrangement between the two of us going to look like? There's just usually a, a lot of questions about what it looks like. And so mm -hmm. a lot of that follow-up is about answering those questions as well. So do you, do you help them with, because, you know, clearly the, there, is a, there is a vast difference between residential rental and short-term rental in terms of, of what tenants are looking for, tenants versus guests. You know, a tenant is going to go in and, 
that they've got the time to make the place their own over a period of time, whereas whereas a guest wants to walk in that door and and have it perfect for their very limited stay. How do you advise owners on um, making a property ready for, for, for tourists? Yeah, well, the great thing is, is that in both of my arrangements, you know, whether it's co-hosting or the master lease, both of them, I mean, that, that sort of getting it ready for guests is on me and my company. Mm -hmm. And so it really takes the guesswork out of it for the homeowner. They don't have to learn how to do it. That's, that's what my company provides. And it's just a difference in, you know, who's responsible for paying for it, basically. In a, in a mass release situation, the way I look at it and the way I run it is I'm a tenant. And as a normal mm -hmm. tenant, I would furnish it and I would get the space ready and, you know, it would be my place. And so I'm simply getting it ready knowing with the guest hat on that you're talking about, right? That this is a vacation rental. This needs to be set up for guests. Um, and so that's how we get the space ready. Um, in a co-hosting situation, you know, the, the homeowner is responsible for those costs, but I am definitely consulting them, helping them. Um, to get it ready for the guests as well. This sounds really interesting. I, I hadn't even you know thought of being able to sort of combine the two, do a, a you know, property the, the property management that covers properties that that the owners you know have have a good stake in themselves, and then those that uh, that where, where they're really handing it over to you. Um, I mean, you're almost buying into that property. Exactly, and that and that is exactly what happens, and. I will tell you that the master lease um, arrangements tend to be, you know, long term. I mean, I've had some of the same master leases that I've had from the very beginning. I still have today because ultimately it does. It starts to feel like, you know, our, mm -hmm. our property, we take ownership over it. And the homeowners have never felt that before where, you know, someone's willing, a, a company is willing to make those small maintenance um, fixes ourselves because we're just as motivated as the homeowner is to keep the place nice mm -hmm. because there are guests right there are guests that are expecting the place to be nice and so a lot of times we'll go above and beyond what a normal tenant will do because just like you just mentioned like the ownership piece really does become a part of it so. yeah so are, are all your properties in in close proximity to where you are or do you have any remote uh, locations? Most of them are in Colorado. Uh, I have one in Arizona right now, as well as I have had one in Japan. Uh, <laughs> but they are all over Colorado, so they are not particularly close. I mean, some of them are like three to four hours away from each other. So I definitely have a team, um, you know, of folks uh, running the show. Um, and that is how it's possible. So, so, so it sounds very similar, in fact, to my, my own company because our, our, our properties are very widely dispersed. However, however, for us, um, we have great difficulties in finding cleaning staff. So often it's our owners who go out and do the changeovers. But I'm, I'm, oh. I assume that, uh, that, that so, so you hire, um, hire cleaners, caretakers, maintenance people in all these different areas? Yes, um, we have what we call a helpers list for each property, and it includes three different cleaners, a cleaning company, the handyman, the plumber, the electrician um, nearby that we can call if anything, you know, is needed or goes wrong. Um, and depending on the property, yeah, sometimes the homeowners are willing to jump in for mm -hmm. different things, but we certainly have some properties where the homeowner is actually out of state, so, um, you know, that wouldn't work. I know that's a challenging piece of it and um, finding good cleaners. And, you know, I have some sites that I use to find cleaners that are not simply, I don't know, is, does Craigslist exist? In, <laughs> in, I, don't, I don't know, does it? Well, no, when we don't have Craigslist. We have what's called Kijiji, um, which is very similar, very similar. So it's a sort of like well, the, the Canadian alternative. <laughs> um, to find cleaners um, because it, they're, I don't know about Kijiji, but for, for, for us, Craigslist is really not necessarily a very like high caliber person that's posting mm -hmm. stuff on there. So I use uh, some, you know, sites where actually cleaners have to have their resume, pay a monthly fee to have their, 
um, you know, information out there. They've done background checks, so they're invested in finding these types of jobs. And I've just found that hiring cleaners off of sites like that, I'm just getting a higher higher caliber person. And I and I do pay my cleaners really well. Um, so I, I tend to find people that get attached to a certain property mm -hmm. this for the long haul because this is what they want to do as a profession. And so I'll have like a cleaner, a main cleaner um, per property. And I train them to feel like the property is, is their own and give them a lot of freedom to, you know, if they think it needs curtains, new curtains, let me know, mm -hmm. I'll pay for it. Um, and so they'll go above and beyond um, to just kind of keep that space nice for us, uh, which has been very helpful in the sort of management of properties that are all over the place in Colorado. Yeah, that's, it sounds like, you, you know, you have to be thoroughly organized. What, what sort of automation do you use, Anna? Uh, you know, do you use any automation in, in um your reservation management or emailing or anything else because i'm guessing if you're going outside of airbnb that that then you get into some organizational issues yes and that is a huge reason why it hasn't happened yet <laughs> on any sort of large scale um but i have heard of some and i can't think of the name of the one that was just recommended to me, but some, some organized, they're cleaning, um, software that, you know, hook into home away and Airbnb so that the cleaners automatically get the cleaning notes for each property. And right now I do have an admin that runs all of that piece for me. That really is my automation right now. <laughs> that isn't me. That is a full-time, um, admin that I have doing all that for me, but I do agree that once I get sort of beyond Airbnb, uh, some sort of software management is going to be important. But Airbnb as a platform mm -hmm. does have some automation built into it. So, for example, the welcome notes um, for guests on Airbnb are you're able to save those and then just press one button um, and they will send the right welcome note for the correct property instead of you know having to upload that or email it or anything like that so there is some automation itself built into the airbnb app which we've definitely relied heavily on mm -hmm. as we kind of expand channels we're going to need to invest in some sort of software so having been out in the property management conventional property management world for a long time and and um, knowing that it, how imperative how imperative it is to have a, a good reservation management system, um, I've I sort of looked at Airbnb and thought, oh, this must be wonderful to have it all all there and and have yeah. have you paid and the owner paid just yeah. out of that platform because you know once you get into conventional side of the business, it's uh, it's a little bit more of a challenge. I mean, that's a benefit to the Airbnb platform is it's so user-friendly. It's so set up to just make you successful immediately without, I mean, it doesn't cost anything to sign up for Airbnb. They do take a percentage of um, each of your reservations, but, and the percentage change basis based on the size of the reservation. I mean, there's no initial startup costs mm -hmm. or fees or really even set up to make it all work. And so, you know, especially in the beginning, that was a very low barrier to entry, right? And so I think it's a really great place for people to start if they're just getting started because it's all set up for you. You really don't have to do a lot of these other pieces that we're talking about, which makes it affordable and accessible for anybody. So is this what you're teaching people to do in Airbnb investor style? My, my big thing is teaching people um, how to start where they're at and uh, do this on homes that they don't even necessarily have to own. Um, and again, I'm just, I just have a heart string for people uh, just trying, trying to get started in this. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have this idea that you have to own, you know, multiple properties and there's no way you could get started if you didn't have the ability to do that. And it's, it's not true. And um, so we've got this model that, that works and, and so I, yep, that's what I do is I coach people how to get started, um, whether or not they own properties to do this. Then. So, so could you give us some tips then that you'd give to people who are considering doing this? How would they get started? Well, one thing is they can certainly go 
contact me. I'm happy to, you know, walk people through initial startup steps. And my coaching program is pretty comprehensive. It includes finding a property, selling a property, marketing a property, and then how to turn it on autopilot, which is a big piece of making this scalable. Finding your first property, um, it can can be challenging, and so I, I certainly suggest whether it's me or anyone else, there's there's other people doing this out there. And finding your very first property is important because you don't want to just find any property. There are properties in especially the master lease model that you can lose money on instead of profit. And you know I've got financial models that help determine whether a property is going to be profitable or not. And I would say that that's a really big piece of trying to engage with this model is finding the right property. I won't even talk about the master lease option with, I would say, about like 90% of the homeowners that I engage with because it's not a model that you employ on any property. It really, there are specific properties and specific things that you need to look for um, to ensure that it's going to be profitable. And so I think that's the biggest piece is, is knowing um, which model, you know, whether it's going to be co-hosting or a master lease that a property is, um, is appropriate for. Mm, that's, 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 that's interesting. Um, I, I'm doing, in fact, today, if, um, for, for my listeners, if you're listening to this, um, episode first thing in the morning, on um, the 15th, I think it is, um, I will be doing uh, a webinar uh, for Avalara, who is the, uh, the, the, the company that allows you to um, collect your lodging tax and they help you remit it um, accordingly. We're talking about growing your business, growing your vacation rental business in this webinar. So there will be there will be a link in the show notes for you to come along and listen to that. So, and now I've talked to Anna, I'll probably be including a little bit from her in that uh, that webinar. And um, I'll be joined in the webinar by Rob Stevens, who is the um, the founder of Avalara My Lodge Tax. And he has a lot of experience in the conventional property management area, um, dealing with conventional property managers. So I'll be talking in that uh, in that episode about the different ty- different ways you can grow your business. And now I've talked to you, Anna, I'm going to include that in there. <laughs> if in fact you are listening to this uh, this episode later, we've then you can actually go back to Avalara My Lodge Tax and uh, and check on the um, the archived webinars, and you'll be able to 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 watch it then, um, because we're all about growing this business and growing into different aspects of the business. And uh, you know, Anna, you have been just a, a, a delightful resource. I've I've learned a lot in this short time we've been talking. If if you can just share now where people can find you online, um, that would sure. be great. Sure. So I the best place actually is to find me on Facebook. Um, you can either find me personally, which is Anna Rollins, or I have a Facebook group, um, and that is very active with tips and information about the master lease model and the co-hosting model and, um, you know, just how to do this, how to get started. I post all the time in that group. So that group on Facebook is just simply Airbnb investor style. Um, and I will tell you that instead of spelling Airbnb traditionally, I put a money sign where the N would go. But I also have a website, www.airbnbinvestorstyle.com, so you're welcome to look me up there as well. Um, but if you're looking to engage, definitely find me on Facebook. I will add you to the group. I would love to, um, and feel free to reach out to me um, through the group, and I'm happy to answer questions. So, yeah. That would be great. That, that's, that's lovely. Well, I'll make sure that I put all those links onto the show notes so that um, that if you're out there running and jogging or hiking or in the car or all these places that I know you listen to this podcast and you can't get to uh, get onto this site and go, get onto Anna's um, uh, Facebook group at the moment, um, just go to cottageblogger.com. Um, 
and uh, and you'll see the uh, the podcast there the latest podcast and if you go to the show notes then you will be able to see all those links and also you can comment of course ask Anna questions uh, on the show notes page and if we get some questions I'll make sure I direct Anna to them so she can come along and answer for you so thank you so much for joining me it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you Anna yes all right well thanks take care That was terrific. Thank you so much to Anna Rawlings of Airbnb Investor Style for joining me and explaining some things that I really had no clue about. Um, I I didn't really know what co-hosting meant. I certainly didn't know what master leasing was. And I'm still a little bit up in the air about arbitrage. So I'll be Googling that and having a, having a look at, um, at what that's all about as well. I think this master leasing thing, I, I had the impression it was like, you know, this subletting, uh, which I guess it is to a degree, but in, in a more, with, with a much more professional approach. So I'll be researching a bit more into that. So as I said, if you are listening to this uh, on, on the day of publication, please head on over to the uh, Avalara webinar this afternoon when I'll be talking a bit more about how to grow your business, but we'll be looking at the conventional methods of property management as well, you know, how to go from owning just one property into managing properties for other people along conventional lines, which is, you know, when you can advertise on Airbnb and TripAdvisor and VRBO and Booking.com, which of course requires you to become incredibly organized, which this is why I was so interested in the Airbnb model, because everything's done for you on this one platform and it, it does make it easier. But once you, once you start to look outside those platforms, then it, it, it becomes a, a little, I was going to say a little more challenging. It becomes a lot more challenging. So I'll be going through the different stages in setting up a property management company, all the different things that you have to do to make it successful. And of course, as I said, if you're listening to this at another time, then of course you can go to um, Avalara Mylodge Tax and I will put a link to that in the show notes and you'll be able to go into the archives and check on that webinar. So hopefully you'll come along and have a look at that. Have a look, have a listen and let me know what you think. So that's it for uh, for today. It's been an absolute delight, as ever, to be with you. Um, and of course, you know, I love to hear from you. It's been great recently, the past couple of months, when I've been talking a lot about the Vacation Rental Success Summit, and I've been saying, you know, that we do have this discount code that a, a lot of people have come to me and taken advantage of. I've got to connect with with a lot of listeners. And it's been fantastic. I'm learning about people from all over the world. So please do get in touch with me. Tell me about your property. You can email me at heather at cottageblogger.com. I would love to say I will get back to you immediately. But you know, there's a lot of calls on the time at the moment. And but I will get uh, get back to you. And, uh, and you know, talk to you about your property. If you've got any questions, please let me know. And, and I will endeavor to answer the, in the best way I can. So hopefully you've enjoyed this episode. It's been, an, as I say, been a delight being with you as ever. And I will be talking to you again next week. This episode of Vacation Rental Success is over, but don't worry, Heather will be back soon. Want more great resources? Visit cottageblogger.com for tips, tricks, downloads, and strategies to help you achieve profit from your vacation rental business. Oh, 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 oh,